Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Happy Friday. Hope you guys have some fun plans for the weekend. I have none, and I'm just going to go where the day takes me. We'll see where I end up. Not the pokey, because I would never survive in there. All right. So before we get started, one thing to clarify from last episode. I talked about Jason Mao being in Rexburg on August the 3rd and the 4th. During his interview with detectives, it was revealed that his sister is actually married to a high school principal in Rexburg, and he was up there at a school function to speak. So just wanted to make sure, you know, that I put out there why he was there. So anyways, music trivia before we get started. The number one movie soundtrack of all time is still from 1992, The Bodyguard. Second place, 1977, the year yours truly was born, Saturday Night Fever. Number three, Dirty Dancing, which part of that was actually filmed not too far from here, about 45 minutes to an hour at Lake Lure. You can go up there and visit some of the filming locations. Finally, have to wish a very, very, very happy birthday to my grandmother, Sarah, Grammy, as we call her. She will be 88 tomorrow on the 13th. She is the backbone of this family. She is precious to me, and she is literally my best friend, her and my mama. So I've been raised by some good ones. So happy, happy birthday, Grammy. Love you so much. All right, let's get started. September the 10th. Alex and Zulema start referring to Chad as James the Lesser or JTL because they believe Chad was the younger brother of Jesus in a previous life. Okay, so I'm just going to say if somebody ever walked up to me and said they were the brother of Jesus in a previous life, I would tell them they probably should talk to a trained professional. But apparently this group was like, oh my gosh, wow, we're hanging out with Jesus's brother from a past life. I don't understand the thought process with these people. I mean, really? So also on September the 11th, investigators make a note in the report that the communication between Lori and Chad's Bubby account stopped on that day. The same day, Alex pawns items at, and I hope I say this right, Ammon, Idaho. He used his Arizona driver's license and a Rexburg address. So I'm curious because we all know that pawn shops keep super, super detailed records because they want to make sure it's not stolen stuff if the police come looking for things. So I'm sure they not only have him on video, but a list of items that he sold. I'm curious to see what it was. Maybe that'll come out at trial. We never know. September 12th, 2019, investigators find an email looking for Charles's tax return. And also they found an email that was sent to Alex's landlord in Arizona saying that Alex had been in a car accident and he was unable to return. He was being served with eviction notices. So they just said, well, let's just lie and get rid of that. September 13th through the 16th, they found some emails between the Arizona Department of Economic Services and Lori, and it was regarding JJ. This place provides economic assistance to families. And I kind of wonder if maybe this isn't having to do with the money for that really amazing school in, in uh, Arizona that he went to, the Life Academy. If you remember, she had said that they were having to pay $125 a day because his funding hadn't come through. So I don't think Lori would have qualified for any kind of economic assistance. And at this point, she's already in Idaho. So that's kind of what I think. Also, here comes Zulema with her ailment of the day. We know with her, she texts Lori, could you and James take a look at what's going on with my right arm and hand? I've been casting and healing and using my right hand a lot. I feel they're attacking that part of my body because of that. Thank you, beautiful can't wait to see you on Sunday. So Lori comes back and says, we just came and gave you a blessing. I hope you felt us there. We really were. Zulema says, you're the best. And Lori says, it was powerful. Are you better? So excited to see you this weekend. They are definitely trying to stop you. We will do amazing work while you're here. 
So Zulema says her oldest daughter's dad was in a motorcycle accident on September 11th and is in critical condition. Lori says, oh my goodness, that's crazy. And guess what? Zulema says, my hand does feel better. It's a miracle. Wow. Um, but I have a bad feeling about Kevin, my ex in the accident. He wasn't in good shape. So he's having way too many complications. I tell you, life is a little crazy right now. I can't wait to go see you guys and get a break for a couple of days. Lori says, thank you for the beautiful weather here today. I'm sure you're doing it as a prep for your trip. It's 82, sunny and gorgeous. So September 14th, I'm going to throw this picture up on YouTube. JJ was at Bear World and Zulema, um, well, actually investigators know on top of this picture, they also have a 40 second video that has Lori, Alex and JJ in it. I've never seen it. I don't think that has been released. I would be curious to see it. Um, so for me, this picture, really the first time I ever saw it, it made me really sad because at this point, JJ hasn't seen Tylee for five days at least. And he just looks alone. I mean, he is alone, but he's just kind of staring off in the distance. He doesn't look excited He's not looking at the camera. I don't know. It just this picture speaks to me that this little dude was having some struggles. Bless his heart. Oh, man. Um, so Lori texts Zulema. We are at Bear World. It's such a beautiful day. Thanks to you. She texts Zulema a picture of who I assume is Alex because Zulema says, who's that handsome prince? Lori says, I think he belongs to you. Zulema says, how did I get so lucky? And Lori says, you're a goddess. You probably demanded it. So you can see here we're in mid-September-ish. And um, we know that Zulema and Alex don't get married until the end of November. But they're kind of pushing her in that direction, as you can see. So Lori texts Alex. Well, you can lead a horse to water. Let's just say that. Lori texts Alex saying she's going to pick up JJ's medicine, which we know she doesn't. I was always curious why she lied to him about that because, I mean, they, they're doing so many dirty deeds together. It seems to me that not picking up his medication would be the least of their worries. But another way to think about it, and I was thinking about this last night, you know, was withholding that medication, which obviously causes um, symptoms that are more intense when they're unmedicated was that kind of a thing with Alex to say hey I'm medicating him and look how he's acting he's got a zombie that's I'm just kind of theorizing here it makes no sense she would tell Alex she's going to fill JJ's medication unless he had something else filled but I have never seen that Alex mentions to Zulema in a text that Lori fell asleep with JJ so September 15th, Chandler PD, they interview Alex's first wife. Now, I need to get that together. I'll do it next episode. But essentially, uh, the entire interview kind of revolves around the fact that soon after she married Alex, she started noticing that there was some sexual inappropriateness between him and Lori, and it made her very uncomfortable, seemed to be accepted within that family. Nobody would say, yo, that's your sister. Um, so ultimately she got out and realizes that she made a huge mistake. Also on the 15th, Zulema um, comes to Rexburg and stays until the 17th. So at 9.45 a.m., Lori texts Zulema before she arrives. So excited to see you today. We've been there two times to bless you. They really don't want you to come here. It's so important. Zulema says, <laughs> Oh, man, Jesus, I felt totally attacked last night. And this morning, my alarm didn't go off for the first time ever. And Lori responds. Oh, my gosh. At 226, Lori responds. We are just outside the tent, ready to pick you up. It's a beautiful day. You did it. 404, Lori Ford's Zulema, a text from Chad. Says, please have Zulema send a message to me that she's in Rigby and wanted to see if I could come listen to her talk tonight about her trip to Chile. He wants you to send him a text so he can come talk to us tonight. 
September 16th, Chad, Lori, and Gib do a podcast titled Three, Fill the Fire. Chad Daybell sharing Jesus' love. And the description says, emerging from a spring and summer break, Chad Daybell joins Lori and Melanie to share things he has been shown about the Savior of the world with insights from two near-death experiences and a visionary gift that was opened up to him because of his visits beyond the veil. You can see a 10 episode series with Chad called Beyond the Veil here. They give a link to that. Chad is the publisher and owner of Spring Creek Books. He has written 25 books of his own. They give the link to that. They do not fail to mention that that brings him a measly two grand a year. September 17th, 7 11 a.m., Lori texts Zulema. Just dropped off JJ on my way to pick you up for the temple now. Be there in five minutes. At 12.08 p.m., Lori texts Zulema, I loved being with you in the temple today. You're so powerful. Can't wait till you're here all the time. The Lord will guide us. Zulema responds, it was very powerful in the temple today. It was so much fun to be with all of you this weekend. Now I just have to wait until the Lord says it's time for me to go. Because clearly the Lord was not telling her uh, it was time to go. I think it was Zulema like, I want to go to Rexburg. At 3.15, I'm going to put this up on screen if you're on YouTube. A neighbor's ring cam records JJ playing outside of the townhouse with a neighbor's kid. And the owner of that camera said they kept the video because JJ seemed to be angered easily and irritable. They were not told that JJ had autism, only that he was a niece's drug baby. Once they confronted Lori about JJ's behavior and also a lack of supervision. Um, we discussed this in the last episode, but JJ bless his heart. You know, those are things you need to tell the parents of the kids they're going to be playing with because it can explain some behaviors and I think help parents and the kids to tolerate things a little better. And we know that Lori just referred to him as this so many times. And, um, you think about that lack of supervision. We know that Charles had that handicap tag on his truck because JJ was a runner. He would run in parking lots. You think how irresponsible and dangerous it was to let him be outside without an adult watching him. We do know yesterday I showed that picture of him entirely outside, but also um, Kay and Larry, spoke to KSL5 in February of 2020 about that video. And Kay said it was just chilling to her. That is her adoptive son. And for her not to even acknowledge him in that way, I can't wrap my mind around it. And it just scares me. Larry said, I've never seen him out of control that way ever. And there was no doubt she was withholding his medication for him to act that way. Kay said she had a bottle of his medicine. Yeah, she has a bottle of his, I think it's Respiradone. That's what they found in the apartment. And they found several pills in the bottle. I believe it was January 2019 when that was last filled, which would have been way back in Gilbert. Be really even before everything blew up with Charles. So you see how long, unless she had some stockpile, but clearly um, his behavior did not indicate he was medicated. And in January, Kay told KSL5, it scares me she wasn't tending to him. All this change for this little boy with autism, consistency is key for him. And that's very true. You have to kind of do the inventory. He is in the middle of this really stressful time between Charles and Lori. Charles takes him to Texas because, you know, he felt like it was safer for him. Completely agree with that, by the way. And we talked about how it seems that time in Texas with just Charles was very normal for JJ. And um, then Charles disappears. JJ knows what heaven is, 100%. Um, Tylee's got, they moved to a new place where he has no friends. He has none of his cousins, nobody. And then he's starting a new school. That is the perfect storm for a child with autism. It could not have been any more stressful uh, for JJ, I'm sure. So um, also Nate says, you can hear JJ uncharacteristically swearing and police documents say she had not filled his medication. 
And Kay said, I can't understand that because she would have made it would have that would have made an unruly, out of control, angry and all these feelings that he has without his medication. It would have made her life incredibly easier than with him not taking it. And that's very true. So you have to wonder the the reasoning behind not medicating him. He would have been easier for her to handle 100 percent. It would have helped her to maybe do her evil deeds a little easier, but I still do think not medicating him starting in January was part of all this to get to where, unfortunately, on the next episode we're going to get to. If you look behind me on YouTube, there is one of my kittens. Yeah, he's just back there having fun. So Kay says the only reason I can think of her not giving it to him is one, she didn't know where it was, or two, she didn't want to feel it, feel it, feel it, feel it, because maybe she didn't want anyone to know where they were. That's a really good point, too, because we know shortly after January, she was gone those 70 something days. And um, the only reason, or, or she says, um, or she was keeping him more agitated to keep her ag agitated to keep him moving down the path to keep her moving down the path she was on, which was a very dangerous homicidal path that she's been on since July. Exactly right. Still think it was justification. If you remember, she's trying to tell uh, Melanie Gibb and David Warwick when they come that, you know, he's doing all these things. So Kay emails Detective Moffat saying that Brandon saw JJ and he was okay and they were relieved to hear that. So I assume on FaceTime because Melanie's never said that she saw JJ when they were in Rexburg, if you remember. So I'm not sure how that happened. So Melanie's texted Brandon uh, and asked for his new address on this day as well. Gibb publishes Feel the Fire. I believe she had already published the Kindle version or the paperback version of it on this day. Whichever one she didn't do was, was published. I didn't put it down here. So this cat back here, y'all, is distracting me. Investigators note that the 17th is the last time Lori mentions either one of the kids in any remaining text with Zulema. She tells Zulema she's dropping JJ off so she can go to the temple. Lori also tells Zulema if anyone is seeking her destruction, which said Christina or Serena, her family and such, if they ask where she is, Zulema can tell them she moved in with her brother in Queen Creek. Wednesday, September 18th, 2019, Lori reaches out to a babysitter. This babysitter gave a big, long statement to Justin Lum at Fox 13. Justin Lum, who we love, him and Nate Eaton have been all over this case. Morgan Lowe, just really good journalists and have uh, schooled us on this case a lot. Um, so after the kids were reporting missing, she said this, and these are her words. Lori Vallow messaged me through care.com responding to an ad I posted looking for work. She said she was interested in me nannying or babysitting Josh and gave me her personal phone number. It's easier to text than to message through the app, so we continued our conversation through text message. I don't have those texts, so I'm going off a of memory about what we talked about. She asked me to come over for an interview to see if I could handle watching JJ, since he has autism. I went over to their townhome and met Lori and JJ around 2 p.m. She was wearing workout clothes, but looked well put together and happy. She was very welcoming and gave me a hug. Their home was clean. She had a picture of a temple on the wall. She explained to me as we watched JJ play outside with the neighbor kids, some of his tendencies. He gets emotional easily, frustrated, distracted, has difficulty communicating with others, but can follow orders if you look him right in the eyes. She explained to me how they recently moved here from Arizona because her husband had just died of a heart attack and how JJ doesn't quite understand the situation. Lori said how she and her husband adopted JJ and that actually he was her nephew. Her daughter also lives in Rexburg and is going to college. She said her daughter doesn't like to babysit JJ without being paid, so she wanted me to work for her. Occasionally, her daughter would come visit for dinner or to do laundry, but she never said that she lived there with them. It appeared that only Lori and JJ lived there from the looks of things and from what she told me. 
She showed me how their TV worked, some options for food to make him, and activities we could do in the future like go to Gravity Factory. She then mentioned how the next day she needed me to come over for a few hours to watch JJ while she went to the airport to pick up a friend. I told her I was available and could come over. We communicated payment methods for her, which was cash. Usually people I work for use Venmo, but she said the best for her was cash. I then left and returned the next day. My overall impression of her was that she seemed kind, but stressed out being a newly widowed mom along with her, alone with her autistic son. So on the 19th, I returned to their townhome and parked in the back by the garage where the visitor parking was. I don't remember seeing any other cars. And when I walked inside, she mentioned how she was waiting for her brother to come and leave with her to the airport. She said she was going to the Idaho Falls airport and that her brother also lived here in Rexburg. She mentioned how if she got home later to give JJ his medicine right before bed because it makes him tired fast. And then she joked about how she liked that because some days when he was extra tough for her to handle, she would give him his meds and have him go to bed early to give her a break. Then her brother came over and was quiet, just said hello, and then they left. JJ was upset about her leaving and went into the garage. I followed him to make sure he didn't block the garage from closing. I vaguely saw her car and her drive off. The rest of my time there was pretty relaxed and JJ just played with the other kids outside. He followed the kids that were about two years younger than him because they were more on his mental level. They played hide and go seek, would play with toys, etc. A lot of the time he seemed to be in his own little world, kind of talking to himself. He had a toy that he loved called Ducky. It was a toy him and his mom made from Toy Story. He loved it and carried it everywhere with him. She earlier explained to me how she had to order certain parts for the toy to make it complete. Eventually, it was time for dinner, and I fed him easy mac and cheese. He didn't eat much because he wanted to go play with the other kids. I had to lock the door and the top lock to prevent him from leaving before his dinner was finished. Lori said she had to put a lock on. She had to put on two locks because sometimes JJ escapes. Once I felt like he ate enough, I let him go back outside to play. He later ended up at the neighbor's house, and I tidied up Lori's house while he was there. Once I finished, I went to go get JJ from the next door neighbor's house. He was good friends with their son and played with him often. When I went to go get him, the friend seemed upset about a dispute over toys. JJ wouldn't share or something Joshua did upset his friend. This cat, y'all. Never record an episode with kittens in the room. Um, so the little boy said he didn't want JJ over to his house anymore. They left and this upset JJ greatly. He started crying and screaming. I told him to calm down, distracted him with a show, tell him how sometimes people just need a break and how he needs to share. He threw the chair from their wooden table down, flipped the ottoman over by their couch, and then ran upstairs. I let him cry for a bit, hoping he would calm down, but he didn't. I felt I should check on him to make sure he wouldn't hurt himself or break anything, so I went upstairs. I quickly found him under the bed in his mom's room. He also had a room upstairs, but from what I remember, it just had toys in it and no bed. Lori's room appeared normal. She had a large bed, bathroom, and it was clean. Although something kind of strange was that there was a small mattress in the corner where JJ slept. It was pretty thin, the size of a twin mattress with sheets and a pillow. There was a mirror hanging above the mattress in the corner, and as J.J. ran up from under the bed, he went towards the mirror and knocked it off the wall. Hoping it didn't break glass all over the mattress, I picked it up. While doing so, he ran back downstairs. As I went downstairs, J.J. was still upset and said his mom would not want me to come over again and that he hated me and didn't want to be my friend. Shortly after this freak out, his mom, her brother, and the friend walked in from the garage. The mom calmed JJ and asked me what happened. I explained the situation and she babied him as if he could never do nothing wrong. It felt a little, little overwhelming the amount of love she was showing him instead of trying to teach him and calm him. So, you know, with Lori, I think that's for show. I'm going to show Melanie Gibb and the babysitter how nurturing it's a front y'all. She introduced her friend to me and said that she does podcasts of some sort. 
I didn't see a suitcase, so I don't think she was staying that long. Lori then thanked me for coming and paid me in cash about $40. We didn't discuss another time for me to babysit because of the situation with JJ, but we had this unspoken knowledge that I would continue babysitting for her. From what we had talked about yesterday, that was what she seemed to be needing was nearly daily assistance for me. And that was the last day I saw JJ and Lori. So on September the 24th, and we know that this overnight 23rd into the 24th was when JJ was murdered. I think this day I must have texted Lori about coming back and working more because I was hoping to keep earning money. Anyway, she responded to me that JJ was with his grandparents for a month and she was in Hawaii. She said in about a month when they came back, I could work again. Well, once that month passed, I texted her again around Halloween time asking if I could work. There was no response. I was upset she didn't respond because it had been hard for me to find a job. And I thought it was pretty weird that they just up and left for a month and didn't need me to work ever again after that. And especially after just hiring me. It seemed irresponsible for a mother to dump her kid off to the grandparents while she had a good time in Hawaii. I'm assuming she must have really needed a break from JJ, I guess. And I left at that. That was the last time I ever communicated with Lori. So you see here, that was a one-time thing for her to go get Melanie Gibb from the airport. I don't think David Warwick came in until maybe the day after. He did not come in with Melanie as far as I'm Melanie Gibb, as far as I know. Um, so also on the, um, let's see, we jumped there. Let's get back to what date we were on. Sorry, y'all. Um, these cats like have my brain going in 15 different directions right now. Cause I hear them and they're into something. Um, so we are, I believe on the 17th of September. Okay. Uh, Chad obtains a burner phone and Kay emails Lori asking to have JJ FaceTime or call that weekend. And she also asks when they can come get him for a weekend. She said, Kay says she is begging her and to please have some hum humanity and let them visit him. She ends it with Lori. What are you thinking? Are you even thinking? Yeah. Exactly. So Melanie Gibb testified at Chad's preliminary hearing that zombie means the mortal spirit has left the body. And now the body is the host of another spirit and is always considered a dark spirit. The person's true spirit goes into limbo and is stuck there until the host body is physically killed. She said Lori was the one who told her this and she learned it from Chad. So we are going to end there. We're going to make this actually a little shorter episode today um, because we're getting into the point where, um, unfortunately, we will go through the timeline of when JJ was murdered. And I just want to kind of make that its own episode Um so anyways, I appreciate you guys. We've had a really good week. It's been fun, um, as fun as it can be talking about this stuff. Um, you know, it's all heavy, but um, yeah. So next week, the 16th, guys, big, big day. We're going to see what's up with them too. I tell you, I can read some body language. Back when I did this years ago, I was trained to read the jury's body language. I could tell. What's up? Can't wait. Going to be streamed. Nate Eaton's got that all covered now. Judge Boyce approved it. So we are on like Donkey Kong, y'all. All right. I hope you guys have an amazing weekend and we will see you guys on Monday.